Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, which is part of a programme of enhanced support um, around net zero for the social enterprise sector in Wales, um, delivered as part of the Social Business Wales programme, and it's funded uh, by, by Welsh Government. My name is Mike Brain, I'm the Net Zero Programme Manager, and in this session, um, we're going to be looking at technologies available for addressing transport emissions, um, how we measure measure what share transport has of the, the emissions profile, um, and what plans we can put in place to decrease um, organisations' future transport emissions. Um, I'm delighted to be able to introduce you to Alfred uh, Lewis, who's formerly Transport Decarbonisation Manager at Welsh Government um, Energy. So without further ado, I will hand over to um to Alfred and we can we can get going. Um Alfred. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Um as Mike mentioned, I was uh, transport decarbonization manager at the Welsh Government Energy Service. Uh, I was there for a couple of years, uh, helping the Welsh Government uh, with their internal fleet uh, and also local authorities uh, and other sort of Welsh Government uh you know, connected organisations like the police service and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm just going to share a little bit about um, transport decarbonisation, the technologies that are available in this sector um, and so on. Um, I'll just start presenting. Okay. Hey. Um, so yeah, my presentation is how the UK road transport sector will decarbonise to meet the uh, the 2050 net zero carbon target date. Um, so a little bit about the different uh, layers of government in the UK and, and their sort of respective plans to, to meet this challenge. Uh, the UK government's plans are to end all sales of um, non-HGV uh, vehicles that use fossil fuels by 2035. Uh, we all remember, of course, that it was originally 2030. Uh, that's now been pushed back to 2035. Uh, we're a couple of weeks away from an election, so of course this could change in the near future as well. Um, heavy goods vehicles, uh, similarly, uh, using fossil fuels, the sale of new uh, HGV vehicles using fossil fuels will end by 2040 at the latest. Um, and the current plans are for all government car and van fleets to be fully electric by 2027. So just a few notes on, on these uh, different target dates. It should be noted that this is the, the dates for when uh, fossil fuel vehicles will, will, will end. Is This isn't the point at which all fossil fuel vehicles will be off the road. This is the point at which you uh, people will no longer be able to purchase new fossil fuel vehicles. Um, second-hand markets and, you know, classic cars and so on will continue to be fossil fuels uh, past these dates. Uh, having worked in the Welsh Government's Energy Service um, and having, you know, discussed uh, uh, with uh, other local authorities and other government sectors within um, England and Scotland as well, um, it's doubtful in my mind that they'll reach that 2027 targets, but that's the ambition is to um, transform the government's carbon van fleets by that date or as soon as possible after. But the UK government's plans for transport decarbonisation is the same pattern as we see today, which is mainly private car use uh, for, for the majority of our travel needs, but swapping fossil fuel vehicles for um, petrol or these, uh, sorry, for electric or other alternative fuel vehicles. Um, there's no plan here to within at the Welsh uh, at the UK government level to transform how we do transport in the UK. In contrast, uh, the Welsh government's plans are quite ambitious. Um, there's quite a lot in in the Welsh government's plans around active travel and making active travel, you know, walking and cycling and so on, the default choice for short distance journeys. Um, there's also uh, plans to improve the public transport infrastructure in Wales, particularly rail, which is now, of course, um, the, the rail operating company in Wales is now under the control of the Welsh Government um, and also the bus services as well. Uh, we've all heard of the Welsh Government's plans, for example, to stop building new roads in Wales. 
um, just maintaining the roads that we already have. And, and part of the ambition here is to use the money that we would have been spending on new um, constructing new roads and investing that instead in public transport in Wales. The 20, uh, 20 miles per hour limit in residential areas is also part of this strategy. Um, and finally, the, the Welsh Government has a very ambitious EV charging strategy to address some of the difficulties of charging electric vehicles in Wales today. Um, if we look across the UK, um, the motorway network is really very well served by EV charging infrastructure um, at, you know, um, as of today. But the difficulties are in more rural locations where there's a there isn't as much concentration of people. And, and if you go back three or four years in Wales, we, we had good EV charging infrastructure along the M4 corridor and along the A55 corridor in North Wales, and not a lot in between. Um, that's been transformed really over the last couple of years. Um, I live in Dolgetha. Uh, there's a rapid charger here in Dolgetha near me. There's another one in Bala. Uh, you know, there, there's there's uh, a good concentration of electric vehicle charging points in rural Wales now, thanks to the Welsh Government's investment in rural areas. There's still a few gaps. Um, there's a stretch between Dolgetha and Brecon on the A470, uh, which isn't very well served by um, charging points. But again, that the Welsh Government has a plan to address some of those shortcomings. So what are the challenges in meeting both the, uh, the UK and the Welsh government's ambitions for transport decarbonisation? As already mentioned, charging infrastructure is getting a lot better, uh, particularly the rapid charges that you would need if you were travelling long distances. But there are still challenges, um, particularly um, residential charging uh, challenges. If anyone has a, a driveway on their house and they, they can install their own charge points, then they have access to very, very cheap tariffs to charge up their cars. Um, my own uh, electric vehicle is charged overnight on an eight and a half pence per kilowatt hour uh, plan. If you don't have your own off street parking um, and you're relying on the public um, charging infrastructure, you may be paying 85 pence per kilowatt hour, 10 times uh, what someone you know with with their own driveway would be paying, so there's a yeah there's a there's an economic justice element here um, to the charging infrastructure and making sure that those people who live in terraced houses or who don't have off road parking also have access to cheap and effective overnight charging. The vehicles themselves, of course, uh, cost a. Um, a bit more than their equivalent internal combustion engine equivalents. Um, a good rule of thumb uh, for a lot of the battery electric vehicles is that they could cost as much as £10,000 more than an equivalent uh, petrol or diesel vehicle uh, for the same you know, class of vehicle. Uh, there are some cheaper models coming out, uh, particularly there's a few um, Chinese manufacturers who are now starting to export vehicles into the UK. Uh, and for some of those, that price difference has, has dropped to between, again, between 5,000 at the low end to 10,000 pounds more for an equivalent electric vehicle. But there's definitely still a premium on purchasing electric vehicles. There's also, in theory, a choice of technologies. In, in practice, there isn't. Um, if you want a zero emissions vehicle today, uh, a battery electric vehicle is it, essentially. But there's a perception that hydrogen vehicles could come in the future, uh, although we can better make use of biofuels or synthetic fuels uh, for, our, um, you know, for our transport decarbonisation needs. Um, the issue is whenever we have a choice of technologies, if, if you're old enough to remember, as I do, the VHS and Betamax wars or the, um, you know, the high definition DVD versus Blu-ray war, whenever there's a choice, people are confused and they don't know which one to go for. And they're worried about uh, deciding to use a particular technology that then doesn't win out. And so it sort of creates confusion in uh, consumers' minds, which means they inevitably put off the decision to uh, to switch to a new technology. But at the moment, battery electric is it. 
Um, very hard to purchase a hydrogen vehicle if you do manage it, even harder to find somewhere to refuel it. Um, and even if you are in a lucky position of finding somewhere to refuel it, the cost will be quite astronomically high. So hydrogen isn't really a solution that we have today. Um, biofuels, there are some options there, but we will come on to those um, a bit later in the presentation. Um, long distance journeys have been an issue in the past. Much, much better today, just with the uh, the improvement in the motorway charging infrastructure. I'm just on a recent trip down to London, uh, stopped in a, a, a service station in Rugby. You know, there was a bank of 12 um, rapid chargers from one company along one side of the packing, and then there was another eight from a different company on the other side. And then the other end of the car pack, there was another 15 Tesla chargers. So really, the, the, the motorway um, infrastructure is excellent today. Um, but there's still a perception that long-distance journeys can be problematic, and particularly if, if you're in the second-hand electric vehicle market, which some of the older vehicles don't have as much range as the vehicles we uh, available today, uh, new today. Um, this could be a, a smaller issue. There's also the issue around loss of fossil fuel tax. Uh, Every uh, litre of petrol or diesel we buy, a significant chunk of that is uh, taxes that goes uh, to the exchequer and which pays for road uh, maintenance and other things um, that we all want. Uh, an electric vehicle doesn't use petrol. So, um, yeah, uh, if you're charging at home, there's uh, there's no VAT on it. If you're charging uh, in a rapid charger or, or somewhere on, um, on your way, there's a 20% VAT on it. So there's significantly less tax take from an electric vehicle compared to a fossil fuel vehicle. We do have to remember though, that if electric vehicles are five to 10,000 pounds more expensive than their petrol equivalent, the government is making one to 2,000 pounds extra in VAT on the sale of that vehicle. Um, but that won't make up the shortfall in fossil fuel taxes over the lifetime of the electric vehicle. And this is something the government's looking at and will have to address in the future. Um, another challenge is calculating the entire life cycle carbon dioxide emissions or the CO2 equivalent emissions of alternative fuel vehicles. Um, typically, electric vehicles will, will take a, a, a reasonable amount more CO2 to produce, to build, um, than an equivalent fossil fuel uh, vehicle. So we also have to consider that in the equation when we consider whether an electric vehicle will you know, adequately save carbon versus a petrol or a diesel equivalent. And there's also an accounted for carbon emissions, particularly, uh, we've already mentioned, uh, new cars coming in from China, uh, where the grid is heavily dependent on coal, um, and where there's a lack of transparency over how much actual carbon emissions have gone into the production of some of those vehicles. So as we get ca uh, cars coming in from uh, other countries, it makes it quite difficult to calculate some of those extra carbon emissions. So this is the timeline for the, the UK and Welsh government's sort of vision for how we will transport uh, decarbonise transport in the UK. Um, so moving from today, well, around about the 2% of UK cars and vans on the road are zero emission vehicles. Uh, but new sales, you know, accounts for between 10 and 20%. I think it was 16% last year. There is a perception that the sales of electric vehicles are falling. Um, this isn't actually true. They did grow over the past year, um, but they're growing at a slower rate than they have been. There's been quite dramatic jumps up in the percentage of electric vehicles that have been sold. Whereas two years ago, I think it was about 15% of the market. Last year, it was 16. So the rates of increase has definitely slowed. Um, but the amount of electric vehicles being sold as a percentage of the UK market hasn't actually been falling. By 2077, the vision is for all UK government fleet cars to be fully electric or zero emissions. Uh, 2035, again, this could change in a couple of weeks if we, if we end up with a change of government. Um, the sale of new petrol and diesel cars and vans will stop. By 2040, at the latest, um, only zero emissions vehicles will be used in the heavy goods vehicle category. And by 2050, the UK plans to be net zero emissions for UK road transport um, as a whole. What this means is um, petrol and diesel 
uh, fossil fuel will end in 2035. But of course, the cars that have been sold in 2034, 2033, 2032 and so on will still be on the road for a number of years. But by 2050, those will have been recycled out of the UK road transport network. It is important when discussing road transport decarbonisation to, to look at the transport hierarchy. This was come up uh, with by um, the Energy Saving Trust, and it gives you sort of the, from the best to the worst transport option uh, for your organisations. Digital communications is by far the best from a carbon perspective, so we're all meeting here on Zoom. Uh, the carbon emissions from this will be very, very low. Uh, we could all have met in Rheadr or Aberystwyth or somewhere in Mid Wales, uh, all travelled there in our uh, ice cars. Um, but uh, yeah, our, our emissions from this uh, meeting is much lower because we're all doing it digitally. And then when we're able to walk or, or, or wheel, um, th this is the best thing for us. You know, this exercise for us is extremely low, low carbon. Um, there are carbon emissions from walking because obviously uh, we we eat food which uh, you know powers us as we walk or cycle or so on um, but human powered transport is definitely then the best next option uh, below digital communication so walking cycling or wheeling uh, for people in wheelchairs the next best then is public or shared transport uh, buses trains maybe uh, if we're on a car sharing scheme or um, an electric taxi these would definitely be the next best options where we can't walk and cycle somewhere. Where we can't use public or shared transport, electric vehicles is the next best option, followed by internal combustion engine vehicles, and then air or yeah, shipping or cruise uh, cruises or whatever. Um, those sit at the bottom of the transport hierarchy. So where we can use public transport, we should. But, but we should be realistic. Um, you know, we live in Wales. Uh, if you need to get anywhere in Wales, you know, from a rural area on a Sunday, it's extremely difficult. Um, so as the, the public um, and shared transport options improve, that might give us more options, but electric vehicles then become the next best option um, if you live rurally or you have difficulty accessing public or shared transport. So how do electric vehicles actually reduce carbon and how much carbon do they reduce? Um, so petrol and diesel both emit, you know, two to two and a half kilograms of CO2 per litre that you use in a car. Um, the amount, you know, the miles per gallon, the efficiency of the car, the size of the car, all of this will affect the efficiency. Uh, but on average, according to UK government figures, cars will emit about 0 0.27332 kilograms of CO2 per mile. Bigger cars will emit more, smaller cars will emit less. But UK average fleet emissions, 0 0.27332 kilograms of CO2 per mile driven. Electric vehicle emissions also depend to some degree on the size of the vehicle and the efficiency. Uh, but we measure this a little bit differently. Um, a very inefficient large electric vehicle might travel two miles for every kilowatt hours of electricity that you put in to the car. Um, a very, very efficient electric vehicle could go as high as five miles for every kilowatt hours that we put in. There's also some losses um, when we plug in an electric vehicle. Uh, it, Alternating current AC electricity comes from the plug into the electric vehicle. There's a transformer which transforms that electricity into direct current, which is what's stored in the battery. So there's some losses there as well. So on average, a good rule of thumb is about three miles um, traveled for every kilowatt hour of electricity we pull out of the plug socket into the car. <clears throat> One kilowatt of grid electricity emits 0 0.207047 kilograms of CO2. And this means that for every mile traveled in an electric vehicle, 0 0.0691 kilograms of CO2 is emitted, which is roughly about a quarter of the equivalent average fossil fuel car. So if you drive four miles in an EV, you will have emitted as much 
carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as traveling one mile in a petrol or diesel car. But as the UK national grid continues to add more renewables, wind and solar and so on, those figures for electricity for grid electricity will come down. Um, this will also have an effect on petrol and diesel vehicles because a lot of electricity is used in a in a in an oil refinery, for example, to, to refine petrol and diesel. So the petrol and diesel figures will also come down, but they won't come down anywhere near as much as the uh, grid electricity itself, because the grid electricity is one component of refining petrol and diesel. So over time, that quarter of the emissions from an electric vehicle will decrease further to a fifth, a sixth, an eighth, whatever, um, as, as time goes on. And it should also be noted that if, uh, if, if you at home or your organization have solar panels on the roof and you've already um, included the emissions from producing your solar panels in, into sort of one year's emissions for your organization, this effectively means that your emissions per mile traveled for an EV that you own that's being charged off your solar panels becomes zero carbon uh, kilograms of carbon dioxide per mile driven, which is a significant saving. What this actually looks like in practice, um, what we have here is a graph. Uh, this is just taking an average sized petrol car compared to an average sized electric vehicle. The petrol car will, uh, during manufacture, will, will emit 5.6 tonnes of uh, carbon dioxide uh, in production. The electric vehicle emissions um, would be around about 8.8 .8 tonnes of carbon dioxide for the equivalent car. Obviously, if you compare you know, a very, very expensive high-end electric car to a very, very cheap petrol car, the figures will be wider. But for, the, for, for a similar sized, similar sort of quality level car, these are the figures that we, we would go to go with. And then if we compare that to driving 7,400 miles per year, which is the current average distance driven per car in the UK, um, each year of driving, the petrol or diesel car will emit around an extra two tonnes of carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels. Whereas the electric vehicle will be adding about half a tonne through its use of grid electricity for charging. So we can see from this graph that in year one, uh, the petrol or uh, diesel car looks significantly lower than the electric car. It's sort of manufactured um, emissions are so much lower. In year one, they start diverging quite sharply. In year two, they cross over. And then for every year after that, the electric vehicle is saving more and more carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, by the end of its life, in year 10 or 11, it's, you know, it, it's down to around about a half of what the equivalent ice of um, petrol or diesel car would be. But as time goes on, as the grid continues to decarbonize, as the amount of carbon dioxide for every kilowatt hours of electricity goes in, the electric vehicle line is going to flatten and eventually become straight, whereas the petrol one is going to dip slightly, but it's going to continue rising up. Also, as we start manufacturing uh, new electric vehicles uh, using renewable technologies, maybe re recycling car batteries and so on, the um, emissions from manufacture of the EV is also going to drop quite significantly. The internal combustion engine car will come down as well, but given that it's a massive block of steel or, um, or metal in the um, in the internal combustion engine car is not going to come down as much as the equivalent electric vehicle would come down. So over time, these figures are going to look even more positive for electric vehicles. It's also important to note the efficiency of the two technologies. When we measure um, petrol and diesel emissions, what we actually measure, the, the figures that we were just looking for there, 2.1 and 2.51 kilograms of CO2, what we're actually measuring is the amount of emissions coming out of the exhaust pipe of the car. Um, but there are also emissions that we're not counting. Uh, for example, when we extract um, oil uh, from a, through an oil well, there are losses there uh, that result in, in emissions. When we refine uh, petrol and diesel from crude oil, there are 
uh, massive emissions from that process as well. Uh, the, the currently uh, fossil fuel refining is the largest industrial user of electricity in the UK. Uh, so there are emissions related to that as well. Um, electric vehicle emissions, in contrast, when the, the figures we were just calculating there are from points of um, generation all the way through to movement on the road. So the electric vehicle emissions are actually more uh, positive because we're counting everything when we're counting an electric vehicle's emissions. Whereas when we when we look at a petrol or a diesel car, we're only counting the emissions coming out of the exhaust pipe. So if we actually count, uh, calculated the total emissions from pumping out of the ground to movement of the car, it would be even more positive for electric vehicles. It wouldn't be a quarter, it would be a sixth or a seventh or an eighth. Um, those emissions are quite difficult to, to calculate. That's why we normally don't do that. But just from an efficiency perspective, <clears throat> if we're generating electricity from renewable sources, uh, wind power, solar power, power uh, so on, 74% of the energy that we generate from those renewable sources are used to move the car along the road. There are still some losses uh, in you know, transporting the electricity to you, uh, as I've already mentioned, converting from AC to DC when you put it into the car. But a good rule of thumb is that 74% of the energy that you generate will be used by the electric car. If we were producing our electricity from gas or from oil or so on, there would be more losses because obviously a, a fossil fuel power station isn't 100% um, efficient. The worst case efficiency for an electric vehicle um, using only a fossil fuel derived energy is around about the 30 to 32% efficiency uh, if you're using nothing but fossil fuels to power your electric vehicle. In contrast, internal combustion vehicles, <clears throat> a massive amount of energy just goes out through the exhaust pipe. Uh, quite a lot is used in refining and transport of um, fossil fuels and then extracting it from the ground in the first place. And 13% of the energy, the original energy in the crude oil gets translated into movement for the car, which is fantastically low, really. Um, if um, if we were in a sort of strange world where, you know, um, maybe back when we invented cars, um, electric cars were available back at the turn of the centuries. And it was a, it was a bit of a toss up really, which technology would win, electric or petrol cars. If electric vehicles had have won and we were all driving electric vehicles today and, you know, some sort of reverse Elon Musk came along and invented the petrol car, and explained to everyone that we was going to produce this marvelous new technology, uh, which you know would extract crude oil from the ground, and only thirteen percent of the energy would be converted into actual movement. Everyone would think that this person was mad, but because this is how the norm, petrol cars are the norm, uh, we think it's okay to only use thirteen percent and to essentially waste eighty-seven percent of the energy in crude oil in a very, yeah, in a very wasteful um, manner. So efficiency on the electric vehicle side is much, much higher than an internal combustion vehicle. But we should remember that electric vehicles are not zero carbon per se. Um, the carbon cost of building the vehicle is greater than building a petrol and diesel version today. And the carbon payback period, the amount of time you have to drive that car before you've made enough carbon savings to justify it, um, they vary by model. Uh, but a good rule of thumb is that if you drive 12 to 15,000 miles, your EV will have paid itself back. It would have paid the extra carbon used in its manufacture, and that every mile you drive after that point is a net saving. Uh, for some of us who drive a lot, this can be very quick carbon payback. I have driven, uh, I'm embarrassed to say, 30,000 miles in my electric vehicle over the past year. Um, so my carbon payback period was four or five months. And at that point, um, every mile I was driven was, was a saving. But it will vary person to person. I and mean, if you're a person who drives, you know, one or 2,000 miles a year, uh, obviously your carbon payback period is significantly uh, longer. 
But this, again, will improve as time goes on and as we decarbonize our electricity grid and as we produce these vehicles in a more efficient manner. On to costs. So as already mentioned, electric vehicles cost and they can cost significantly more to purchase. Um, again, good rule of thumb is about a, a ten, five to 10,000 pounds more for, than the equivalent petrol. Um, another cost is that possibly for some drivers, the tires may wear faster on an electric vehicles because the electric vehicles themselves are heavier. And so if you're a person who likes to <clears throat> put your foot down or you know corner very sharply, you will wear your tires out faster. And so there'll be a cost there over the life cycle of the car. Um, but in contrast to the, the fixed costs from purchasing the vehicles, they're significantly cheaper to operate and run. Um, the cost per mile of an electric vehicle is very, very low. Can be, can be as low as a quarter of the price of running a petrol car. The servicing costs are also lower for electric vehicles. The first time I took my first electric car, a little Renault Zoe, uh, to get serviced, uh, the guy gave me the bill at the end and it was uh, 55 pounds. And I almost fainted because <laughs> I'd been used to servicing petrol and diesel cars, uh, which would cost you know a few hundred pounds. Um, the serving same costs are starting to trend up on the, uh, the the electric vehicle side. So it is important if you're, if you're looking to purchase an electric vehicle to find out what the servicing costs would be from your, you know, the main dealers. Um, brake pads also don't wear as fast on electric vehicles. Um, when you brake on an electric vehicle, the electric motor basically runs in reverse and starts generating electricity, which gets stored back in the battery, um, slowing the car down. Um, this means that we you don't need to use the brake pads anywhere near as much. It's only when you really sharply put your foot on the brake that um, bra the uh, brake pads activate on electric vehicles. Um, again, on my first electric vehicle, the, the Renault Zoe, um, there was a recall um, two years in where uh, they, they pulled in my car and they replaced free of charge the brake pads on the brake disc uh, because it, they'd rusted up. They discovered this was a fault because they weren't being used enough. Um, water and moisture was sort of sitting on the, the pads on the discs and they were rusting, which is sort of something never ever happens on a, on a petrol or a diesel car. Um, so it was replaced free of charge and uh, they made some changes to the software to sort of make sure that the pads were being, um, you know, engaged more often to sort of avoid that issue. But brake pads will not wear as much on an electric vehicles and this will be uh, a savings um, to anyone who owns an electric vehicle. The payback period is very, very difficult to calculate because there's such a wide variety of electric vehicles and petrol cars. Um, if you're buying a reasonably costly electric vehicles, uh, the break-even point in terms of costs could be as high as 100,000 miles. Um, if you're lucky enough to have your own car park where you can charge off a very, very cheap uh, overnight tariff, for example, Octoct per score, uh, where you're paying you know, eight, nine, 10 pence per kilowatt hour, the break-even point for the electric vehicle might be 55,000 miles. If you're charging solely from your own solar or renewable power, the break-even point could be as low as 45,000 miles. Um, but it should be noted that second -hand, the second-hand market, and there's some very, very good second-hand electric vehicles available now, the first generation uh, Volkswagen ID3, uh, the Kia e Nero, the Hyundai Kona, um, are not much more expensive than their petrol or diesel equivalents. So the, the payback period for a second-hand electric vehicle today is significantly faster than these figures. These figures are for new, reasonably expensive um, electric vehicles, uh, premium vehicles. Really. I've already mentioned that there are other potential solutions to decarbonize road transport in the UK. Uh, Hybrids are fairly common, as are plug-in hybrids today. Uh, these essentially are combinations of petrol or diesel vehicles with electric vehicles. So they have both a petrol or diesel engine and also little electric motors and a smaller battery than you would find in a full electric vehicle. 
Now with hybrids, uh, as you break, the electric motor runs in reverse, generates electricity that gets stored in a battery. And then once it reaches a certain point, uh, it'll shut off the petrol or diesel motor and run for a little while on the electric motor. Uh, and so what these tend to do is to make the car more efficient. So when where you may get 30 to 40 miles per gallon in a standard petrol car, you may get 50 or 60 miles to the gallon um, in a hybrid car. Um, a public uh, plug-in hybrid, excuse me, is the same as a hybrid, except you can plug it in overnight. So you don't have to wait to engage the brakes to charge the battery. You could plug it in at home, put a little bit of um, uh, you know electric power into the battery ready to go. And then if, if there's 40 or 50 miles of range in there and you're not traveling far that day, you may go all the way into work and back without having to engage the petrol engine at all and then plug it in at night again. Um, what these tend to do though is decrease the emissions of a petrol vehicle a bit, but not as much as you would do in a pure electric vehicle. So maybe a hybrid would have the emissions, say, from a petrol vehicle, whereas in a um, in an electric vehicle, they would be a quarter and they would decrease as the grid decarbonizes. The other downside with hybrids is that you have twice as many things to go wrong. You have a petrol engine that needs to be serviced that can have things go wrong with it. You've got a battery that needs to be serviced that has things that can go wrong with it. You have a, an electric motor. Um, so there's twice as many things in the car. Um, they're more expensive, of course, than petrol and uh, straight petrol and diesel. Um, and the servicing costs, we would expect these to, to be a bit higher than the equivalent petrol or diesel vehicle. There are still some uh, LPG vehicles on the road, not as popular as it was, say, 10 years ago, um, but they're still available. And again, they're more efficient than petrol or diesel cars, uh, but not massively so. So the emissions will be slightly lower than in equivalent petrol or diesels. There's also biofuels, um, HVO, uh, for example. Um, my brother, for a while, uh, went on a bit of a craze of trying to get used cooking oil from the local uh, chippy and making his own biodiesel that he would then put into his van. So when he was driving around, uh, it smelled like there was a mobile chip van uh, driving around the village. Um, HVO is doing this at an industrial level. So big companies will collect used um, cooking oil, um, you know, from uh, yeah, from, from big industrial sites that sort of produce you know lot, lots of um, prepackaged meals and so on, uh, from some um, uh, sort of fish and chip shops and so on. If if they have you know enough the use of oil to sort of justify it, and then they through an industrial process turn this into a biofuel. It's not a zero emissions technology per se because there are emissions from burning this but the emissions are counted when it's first used for as a cooking oil. It's then considered a waste product that if you burn it, there are no emissions associated to that. The emissions go against the fish and chip shop, not against the vehicle that's using the, 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 the HVO. But there are issues with HVO. Um, there have been cases, for example, of um, Unscrupulous firms, uh, particularly you know, in sort of um, distant parts of the world, that have been rubber stamping virgin palm oil as used cooking oil. That's then been shipped into the UK and processed into HVO. So there are issues with HVO. And also, um, unless we all start eating fish and chips three times a day, there's not going to be enough cooking oil to fully decarbonize um, you know, all uh, road transport in the UK through the use of HVO. Another interesting technology is hydrogen, not an interesting energy carrier, I should say, is hydrogen. Uh, the idea with hydrogen is that you take, uh, there's multiple ways of, of making hydrogen, to be fair. Um, the zero emissions version of, of hydrogen is taking water and then applying electricity uh, through a, a special process um, to split the hydrogen off of the oxygen atom in water. Uh, the oxygen just gets released into the atmosphere or gets stored to use industrially if you really wanted to. And then the hydrogen uh, gets stored in a compressed gaseous form that you can then put into a vehicle. Uh, you can then use either a fuel cell, which sort of reverses that process, adds oxygen um, to and generates electricity that then drives the vehicle. Or you can uh, use hydrogen in an internal combustion engine. 
Um, Caterpillar, for example, use this for, for some of their sort of next generation zero emissions um, digging machines. <clears throat> what comes out of the tailpipe in theory is water because the hydrogen just combines with oxygen again and forms water. Uh, in practice, though, if you're using hydrogen in, inter into an, in, in an internal combustion engine, you will still get some, uh, uh, you know, uh, gases that, that are sort of create climate change. Um, there will be some nit nitrates, nitrogen oxides and so on um, that, that will come out of the tailpipe. So it's, it's not a pollution free solution. Um, but yeah, it is definitely an option that is low or zero carbon if the hydrogen the electricity used to produce the hydrogen is from a fully renewable source. Today, 100% essentially of all hydrogen production, however, comes from um, taking fossil fuel and then uh, through a steam reformation process, splitting a hydrogen atom off of the hydrocarbons uh, in the, uh, the, the crude oil. <clears throat> this is where almost all of the hydrogen that we produce today comes from. If you took hydrogen using a steam reformation pro process from derived from fossil fuels and put it into a hydrogen cars, the emissions from that fuel source would be higher than if you had just used pe petrol from that same crude oil. Because if you split the as soon as you split the hydrogen off of the fossil fuel, the rest of it is essentially waste. So yeah. Um, one solution to this is to take the emissions left over after splitting hydrogen from the fossil fuels and pumping them back underground and sort of storing them in old, old oil wells. It's called carbon capture and storage. Um, this isn't something that's ever been done at any industrial scale, but this is one way that the fossil fuel industry hopes to you know, decarbonize their products and then to use hydrogen in transport. And then the final option is uh, synthetic fuels. Well, these are, um, they would, would use hydrogen uh, as well as uh, other, uh, you know, sort of uh, carbon and, and oxygen and so on to essentially make synthetic petrol. So they, they would use, they would recreate what goes into a, a chain, the, the complex hydrocarbon chains in fossil fuels, and they would produce something that looks very like petrol that then gets put into a standard petrol car. Um, and in theory, is uh, zero carbon. <clears throat> we do have to remember, though, that what comes out of the exhaust pipe of a car isn't just carbon dioxide. Um, there are also, you know, um, air quality uh, pollutants in um, that comes from the combustion of uh, of fossil fuels. Um, all of those problems would still remain with synthetic fuels, um, and also the the problem of sourcing the hydrogen for, for for use in making synthetic fuels is also a problem as well. So none of these solutions, just, just like with electric vehicles themselves, are problem free. They all have their challenges. Um, they will all have, you know, better or worse carbon dioxide um, or, or, or uh, reducing properties. Um, but all of these technologies really, um, except for the, the hybrid and the, the gas, are not really solutions that we could deploy at scale today to decarbonize transport in the UK. Synthetic fuels uh, cost about £100 per litre today, for example. So um, not many people are going to be willing to pay £100 per litre for synthetic petrol. So what's the role of the, um, the social, the community sector in transport decarbonization? Um, first of all, I would say that your vehicles um, are important, the vehicles that you use day to day. Um, every social enterprise will be different. Some will be sort of very heavily transport focused, some will not. Um, but, you know, vehicles for, for meetings, vehicles that you might own, uh, these all have car uh, carbon emissions associated to them. Um, and yeah, uh, switching to an electric vehicle or one of the other options out there, and there are not many, is one way that you could address your emissions from transport. Your staff, of course, uh, will drive into their offices, they will drive into meetings. Um, and again, looking at the transport hierarchy, for those that are not able to walk, are not able to cycle and don't have access to public transport, the next best option, of course, is electric vehicles today. I think also your access to land 
buildings and renewable technologies is, is an important piece of this puzzle alongside your role within your communities. So where you have land, where you have buildings in the middle of town, where you already have had a grant maybe to put solar panels on the roof, um, putting in a, an electric vehicle charger, potentially selling some of that electricity to people who need to charge up their vehicles. This, this is one area where the social or community sector can help in the overall transport decarbonisation separate to dealing with their own emissions. There's also a requirement, I think, to making sure that the decarbonisation of the transport sector is a just transition. I've already mentioned there that um, people who lack off street parking, you know, people who live in terraced houses, um, they might have to pay 10 times as much to charge their electric vehicles compared to someone with off street parking, which is a, a very unfair, you know, when you think that the people who will have access to off street parking are probably more well off, more prosperous people already. Um, so providing charging infrastructure, uh, providing access to people in your communities to cheap overnight tariffs, um, using the space, the car parking that you might have in your buildings uh, to, to give some of those um, people who, who want to decarbonize their own, um, their own vehicles, access to off-street parking, uh, I think is a, is, a, is a definite sort of good that we could be doing in our communities. Thank you. That's my presentation. Uh, I hope that was clear and made sense. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please ask. Thank you. Alfred, thank you. That was um, that was fascinating. Really, really interesting. Um, sorry, I keep getting notifications that my internet connection is unstable. So let's see how long it lasts. Um, no, I mean. I personally quite like the idea of eating fish and chips three times a day, but I'm not quite sure my doctor would, would necessarily approve. Um, I think I've got, I've got some statements and some questions, I suppose. I was really interested in looking at the context of the level of emissions per mile of driving a traditional car against that of um, an electric vehicle but also then trying to th I was just thinking well what's that what does it mean in terms of the emissions associated with driving a mile in an electric vehicle um and sort of on a back of an envelope um sort of it seemed to me to be driving a mile in an electric vehicle was about the equivalent to boiling a half filled kettle maybe three or four times mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so driving 100 miles yeah. might equate to the tea consumed by a small community yeah <laughs> in, in in a day just trying to sort of give some 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 context to that yeah. As opposed to that of um, a traditional vehicle, which would be yeah. significantly higher. Yeah. Um, the factors you raise around whether the fuel is powered from solar power, solar power, or from the grid um, is is an important one. Yeah, I think it's also important on that point to highlight again. You know the transport hierarchy that electric vehicles. I don't. You know, it, I know the UK government's plan is to take all petrol and diesel cars on the road and replace them all with electric vehicles. Mm. I much prefer the Welsh government's approach to this of improving public transport and active travel. I think they have benefits on top of just decarbonizing the, the transport sector, which you know are valuable in themselves. We, we all know that you know, there's an obesity, I mean, I could do with losing a few pounds myself, right? So th there's so many sort of co-benefits from taking that approach versus the UK government's one. So it is important not to view electric vehicles as a as a panacea that's going to fix all of our problems. But having said that, they, it's also important to note that they, they have an important role, you know, because we are where we are. We don't have a great public transport, you know, uh, infrastructure in Wales. So we have to do the best with what we have. And so it's important to put electric vehicles in that context. And you're right to highlight that driving a mile in an electric car is also a vast amount of energy that we probably shouldn't be doing unless we absolutely have to. Yeah. Um, and having just driven, not driven, sorry, taken public transport to a community gathering meeting over in um, Pontypridd um, the other week, 
whilst it took me maybe twice the time that it would take me in terms of just driving, mm -hmm. I have to admit that the public transport option worked seamlessly. Um, it was very easy, very comfortable, very straightforward. So, I mean, credit where credit's due. I think Welsh Government are making some some improvements. However, you were talking about the infrastructure and the need to improve the infrastructure, particularly in Wales, where um, there's a lot of green space. So getting from between one place to another is not always straightforward. Mm -hmm. I'm aware that currently the rail network, for example, is only electrified as far as Cardiff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um and I think that that presents some fairly substantial costs for the government um, in terms of meeting their commitment yeah. around enabling, particularly given their emphasis on public transport and the emissions associated with it. I mean, if you're going as far as Swansea and then up the coast, for example, you're out of luck in terms of electric mainline, um, yeah. Yeah. which is going to have quite a significant impact on emissions when you're looking at the comparison yeah. between should I take rail or should I drive mm -hmm. because your single journey isn't necessarily going to have an impact on whether the train goes or not but cumulatively I think the argument is if everybody has the view that they will drive rather than take public transport then the frequency of those trains available is going to decrease yeah. so it's thinking about the bigger picture I think in terms yeah. of what that means so it does make a lot of sense if we get the infrastructure right and make it as easy as possible to make the right choices in terms of the transport hierarchy um then the con the, nat the natural consequence is that things will only then continue to improve and become easier so it's it's it it's taking everybody on that journey with you if you like as much as anything else yeah I was fascinated um to sort of look at what you're talking about the um payback of vehicles in terms of the additional emissions associated with ev manufacture so driving 12 15 miles negates that additional um the additional emissions generated with, with manufacture um but my question to you is around emissions reporting and mm -hmm. who do you think should take responsibility for those additional emissions when it comes to reporting should it be the manufacturer mm -hmm. as a supplier of the goods so therefore in their reporting they have to come up with a plan of eradicating those emissions that are associated with manufacturer of an ev or does that responsibility lie on the purchaser as a part of their own emissions reporting and they yeah. need to factor that in as a part of their year one emissions consumed when they purchase the vehicle or do we do a belt and braces approach and everybody takes responsibility and yeah. we try and cover it cover it off twice because yeah. i've always struggled on this um factor of sort of scope three emissions more so usually with where the responsibility starts and stops absolutely yeah i think one of the problems for me is that you know we're not really pricing carbon properly and so right. price is what we use as a signal in every other Mm -hmm. um, you know, avenue of life, right? So uh, if you have one TV that costs X and another TV that costs Y, uh, and they both look similar and do similar things, you, you will go for the one that costs the less. So there's no signal to send to um, manufacturers to improve their processes to reduce emissions, right? So if if the uh, manufacturer takes it on that they'll, they're going to report their emissions, what you're going to find is that the manufacturers are going to have extremely high emissions yeah and it will matter they'll just be like oh well we, we get to sell our cars it doesn't matter mm -hmm. if the person takes the emissions well if you're buying a car it's because you probably need a car you can't not have a car if you live in rural wales so you do, you'll have to take it on the chin you know you won't be like oh well i can't buy that car because the emissions are too high you just buy it and then your emissions look terrible that year if we price carbon properly then a manufacturer who produces a car in a very efficient way with very low emissions, their car would look cheaper compared to manufacturer B who don't care about emissions and are sort of, you know, using coal power or whatever in the manufacture of their cars. And that would send a signal to the consumers to know which, which one is best. I think relying on people or organizations to sort of do the right thing it is is problematic to me. If we price it properly, that sends the right signal then to people to 
what in terms of what they should be buying. And it sends a signal to the manufacturer as well that this is important, that if they want to be competitive, they have to reduce their emissions. So I think that's a better way of doing it, but we're not doing it. So No, and the fear I have is that because we're not doing it, we're not going to know when we do start doing it per, yeah. as such. Yeah. yeah. My view, ultimately, is whilst I feel it should be the responsibility of the manufacturer yeah. to take account of the emissions associated with manufacturing the vehicle in yeah. the same way that we don't ask the manufacturer to take responsibility for the lifetime emissions of the vehicle when it's on the yeah. road once they've sold it. Yeah. Those, those emissions should be the responsibility of the manufacturer. But if they're not, then the purchaser... And I'm talking about businesses rather than individuals here. The businesses need to take that responsibility and factor it in as a part of their year one emissions in this in very much in the same way that when we talk about emissions associated with power or mm -hmm. heating, we incorporate well to tank emissions, mm -hmm. the yeah. emissions associated with the production of the of the power or the fuel in the first instance out of the refineries, wherever it may be, and the associated trans transportation and distribution emissions, yeah. a good carbon accounter will factor that into your own emissions yeah. and should probably do the same on the transport, I think, yeah. just to... It would show for anybody looking in depth, admittedly, and not a lot of people are going to, but it would show to anybody looking in depth that an organisation is um, taking its responsibility very seriously and taking responsibility for things that it doesn't necessarily have to. And yeah. that should only add to the credibility of that organisation, yeah. in my view. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Um, I was conscious, um, because um, Sally's with us. Sally, did you have any any questions for Alfred or anything specifically that you wanted to discuss, in, it, just in case we didn't touch on something that you were particularly interested in? Or was there anything that you found found a particular, particular use or, or of interest? Oh, Everything. Uh, thanks, Alfred. Um, uh, it was great. And Mike, thank you for bringing me in. Um, uh, yeah, for me, um, the focus, obviously, of today's call has been mainly on so the electric vehicles. I find it really interesting that the Welsh Government have taken the approach that actually in the hierarchy of things, we would prefer to get the public transport network better and more sort of fit for purpose as opposed to the promotion of electric vehicles which like you said are not necessarily going to be right for everyone in all parts of Wales and um, from from my sort of current position and um, we work in the centre of Cardiff we don't have parking facilities for our staff and um, so I, I was certainly looking for some direction and I've got little bits already and things are flying around in my head about how as as a sort of institution we can help not only our communities that are local to us but our staff and how they can sort of reduce their carbon footprint with you know sort of getting to work and um, we, we've moved a little bit away from working at home full time so looking at the digital as being the preference we, we commit to that however if they are going to come into the office we would love to promote public transport over personal cars and um, but it is how how do we do that and I, i'm sort of early in the journey of how do we do that and um, but certainly from a sort of city center location how do we promote public transport over the convenience of so your individual uh, sort of mode of transport i think that's the sticking point um, which could be a sort of a second or third. Or we could have multiple um, sort of variations of this call, I'm sure. Um, but for me, it's, you know, yes, as an alternative electric vehicle would be over and above better than fossil fuels. But how do we promote the, the extra step into let's get that everyone on public transport? Indeed. And, you, you know, you, you can see um, the UK government in particular's focus on EVs in, in the sort of pricing signals they're sending. So, if as an organization you wanted to promote EVs, for example, um, some organizations now, they, they offer like a salary sacrifice for people to purchase an electric vehicle. So you're, you're paying it in your before tax money, right? So you, there's a significant saving there, which makes purchasing an EV very, very effective. But I would love it if they came up with a scheme where you could pay for your train, you know, your annual train ticket out of your pre-tax money or some sort of incentive to sort of get people to sort of move to public transport like that, I think would be really, really good. But we can see that the, you know, the UK government's focus really is on swapping everyone from petrol to, to EVs because the incentives are there for to get people to purchase EVs. They're not there to sort of move people onto public transport, which is, I agree, a shame. That's a really interesting point around salary sacrifice and actually broadening the, the 
the initiative or the concept of it to actually incorporate yeah. public transport costs yeah. as a pre-tax cost um uh, i think that's that that's got some mileage and definitely definitely of interest i think also though um sally it's it's almost about highlighting the additional inconvenience of mm. not taking public transport you know you've got to you've got to deal with getting into town you know into the center of cardiff you've then got to deal with parking and the co associated cost with parking if you haven't got facilities on site to accommodate parking but then you need to weigh that balance up with the additional time it takes people to travel by public transport and the distances that they're they're traveling i mean it, it could well be if you can accommodate the vehicles that, that are coming in for, for a part of your business practice encouraging where people have got predominantly shorter distances an initial sort of conversion to the hybrid hybrid vehicle approach where if people are driving very short distances and not engaging the fossil fuel element of the vehicle quite so much that might give them the confidence to then go the full step further into electric vehicle purchase or or, or something like that but i mean whilst i think there are some fairly clear sort of wrong answers in terms of how you set your transportation policy there aren't any specifically correct answers because it has to be right for your organization and what you're looking to do and how you're looking to do it. But it is about just demonstrating your overarching commitment to the agenda, in, and but putting a solution in place that works for you best. And I think perhaps having a more detailed conversation with somebody like Alfred um, outside, of, outside of this webinar might be able to present some 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 potential solutions for you to think about were there any other were there, were there any other thoughts that you had or any other questions that you wanted us to look at um, more observations in the fact that you know um i suppose i hadn't really considered the um carbon footprint of the creation of the vehicle i think you mentioned it yourself mike and um, you know everyone i think is very um absorbed in what they are doing with said vehicle said uh food waste whatever they are doing as an individual at that sort of moment in time but we don't necessarily factor in how did it get to our plate how did it get to our driveway um and just that has got me even thinking you know sort of further ahead that you know yes we want to in the moment make our carbon footprint reduce on the transport element, on the, if we're working from home, are we doing it, um, you know, sort of in, in, in a sort of carbon, as close to carbon neutral as possible. Um, we've got to then think ahead of how we, you know, the suppliers we use, are they, you know, what are they doing? What is their commitment? And like you said, it's it might be out of our control to a certain degree, but to make that commitment that we are going to investigate those companies that we use, are we getting into bed with people that are have the same values as us? Um, and the staff, are they, educated to a level where they actually understand what mm. it means to be you know purchasing something new putting something on their plate you know it's 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 a much bigger picture you know and something that can't be sort of quantified in an hour webinar but yeah so many so many things that you know from uh, an employer's point of view we could do for our staff our communities our business itself um it's just so much i think um there is a danger here, though, Sally, that, you know, you, you sort of, you move the burden of figuring all this out onto your staff or onto your sort of, um, your, your sort of wider community where, you know, someone needs a new PC and they've got to go off and, you know, do a master's level sort of study and, you know, where the minerals for the laptop came from and all that sort of stuff. And um, I've done a few environmental audits um, and the, the resource I really recommend people have a look at is, uh, things like you know ethical consumer or mm -hmm. which you know the the witch.co.uk mm -hmm. website um they have they've looked at some of these things and they, they've sort of scored different manufacturers according to their sort of environmental policies and how well they report their carbon emissions and it can act as a pretty good proxy to sort of take some of that burden off of you as an organization from having to work out all the sort of you know, the really sort of fine detail of um, where your stuff is coming from. So if you buy something from, you know, the top two or three um, in the list of, you know, ethical laptop manufacturers, now they're not going to be perfect. They're not going to be where we want them to be, but at least, you're, you, you know, you're, you're sort of making an effort to, to make good choices. And that's, that's one great. resource I would definitely consider. Perfect. That's really interesting. Thank you, David. One of the... Um... No, depending on where, where you are in terms of your organization, in terms of its journey around establishing its net zero um approach. 
a part of the social business Wales net zero service offering is that we're currently just about to launch um, a sort of self-assessment action planning um, toolkit. It's going to be um, on the DTA website um hopefully touch wood fingers crossed within the next two to three weeks and what it is is just looks at all of the net zero categories around transport buildings waste water electricity use the whole um, education and training that you mentioned and policy and strategy and helps you to try and ask questions around what you've currently done what you haven't done what would be useful for you and based on your responses we can we will then provide you with an action plan and the associated resources to enable you to start working your way through and prioritizing the things that you want to want to set up so i mean i don't know if that would be of interest to you or not but what i would say is if it is that um to come back to the dta website um or i can record your details and arrange for either myself or somebody to reach out to you once we've got something in place um, so that you can actually make use of that and perhaps have a chat again with us around what your organisation has done thus far and where you actually want to be in terms of your your journey because obviously you've made a commitment to coming along today to actually listen to this so it shows that you're certainly on the right path in terms of what you're looking to do and what you're wanting to do um, but I don't know your specific circumstances so I just wanted to, to, to mention that. Fabulous. Thanks, Mike. Um, well, I um, I was in contact um, with Angela uh, Paxton this morning, um, ah. so I'll um, if it's okay, I'm gonna ask her to forward the details on to Mike. If that's okay. Do yeah, yeah. No, Angela's great. Um, so so yeah, ask Angela and and, and she'll get that sorted. Um, Alfred, I did have about another half a dozen questions, but I'm already aware we're ten minutes overdue. Um, so all I can really um do is is, is I'm not going to go back to them because they were things about infrastructure and making electric vehicle charge points the charging part of it how do we make that more equitable for those that haven't got their own driveways and are able to charge from solar as you say even, even in my area the local council is charging 50 pence a kilowatt hour whereas the local tesco's it's free um and how do we make that more equitable mm. but i think that's probably quite a big question it is and it's it's sort of um you know it's sort of a to some degree, it's a government level question because I pay no VAT on the electricity I put in my car or my driveway. So even if as a social enterprise, you know, you wanted to provide charging to the to the community on, on your building, you'd automatically be adding 20% on to that cost, which I think is, is highly unfair that homeowners who have their own driveway don't pay VAT. You know, homeowners who've got EVs who don't have off-street parking have to pay VAT on their driving. Um, I think that's unfair. There's a campaign, I think it's called Fair Charge, um, that have been highlighting that and have sort of spoken to UK um, Treasury. So that's definitely one avenue of bringing the, the, the cost down to parity. But I, I would also highlight, you know, the role of community groups. You know, I, I know of several community groups um, in Blenheim in York. Um, there's the, the guys in Ani um, Padan Perez. They've got their own renewable resources. They're, you know, they're, they're selling their electricity back to the grid and they're getting maybe, you know, five, 10 pence per kilowatt for it. You know, can those not sort of make, you know, put charge points on some of their buildings, you know, sell some of that to back to help people in the community? Um, at a sort of reduced rate, they'd still be getting more than they'd be getting from the grid. Um, even adding the 20% that they'd have to charge on, you know, uh, that's surely part of the puzzle here in sort of making sure that uh, people from disadvantaged communities or people who live in terraced housing have access to, to fairly priced charging. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's the perennial problem of the haves being able to have access than the have-nots suffering yeah. i won't go any further than that with my political thoughts because it isn't appropriate <laughs> that i do so um it also comes down to technical knowledge and technical understanding of what is capable and what is possible i've worked specifically with a local authority erecting a solar canopy yeah. um fairly large one um in their car park and it covers a significant proportion of their electricity consumption, but there's a lot of generation outside of those hours. And what we did was rather than export it back to the grid to get five and a half pence yeah. export bonus, we set up a private wire connection to the neighboring leisure center mm -hmm. to basically offset their, or to reduce their baseline of, of it, okay. um, emissions. Yeah. 
and because their energy prices were 40p 40 pence a unit yeah we agreed that they'd be charged 20 pence a unit yeah exactly. so it generated four times the amount of revenue that export than exporting to the grid yeah. for the council yeah but it halved the electric bill for yeah. those emissions that were exported yeah. and it's just about thinking outside of the box yeah. so if you've got the land and you've got the space to generate the renewables and there's a mechanism why whereby you don't have to just export it to the grid because yeah. often the um network operators won't allow you to export vast amounts of energy to the grid because they haven't got the capacity and capability to deal with it mm -hmm. if you've got neighbors and neighboring yeah. organizations that can benefit from it yeah. or as you rightly say yeah. set up an electric vehicle charge point yeah. with subsidies and grants that are available to help you do so there are lots of solutions so it is about knowing if you've got a potential opportunity but you don't know what it looks like yeah coming to organizations like yourselves yeah. like dta wales or social business wales yeah. is a really important first step yeah you're trying to sort of map out what a solution might look like i completely agree you know one thing that drove me mad uh, when i worked for the welsh government's energy services you think about all the coastal communities in wales right the beautiful beaches uh when are people going to be at the beach when it's sunny right um they're going to drive to the beach in their electric vehicles you know they're going to pack in a car park they're going to walk in the beach they're going to be there for hours and why not cover those car parks in solar panels right they're generating the majority of their electricity in the summer when it's sunny when people are at the beach anyway plug in the car you know fill it up while you're at the beach and there's sort of an opportunity there, which seems obvious to me, but there is one community group, I think, in, in uh, uh, is it Porth or Porth? Near Aberystwyth, I think it's Porth, right? Both. Uh, which are looking to do something like this, and I, I hope they're successful. But there must be other, you know, similar um, sort of opportunities in other parts of Wales or, you know, places with hydro schemes, little hydro schemes or, Absolutely. you know, now if we get a new change of government, maybe there'll be some wind fans going up and, you know, why not just, yeah, make them accessible to the community? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, thinking outside of the box and recognising yeah. that actually it isn't just transport, it's, it's, it's the whole mix, it's the whole mix. But... Having now managed to take us at least 15 minutes over, I will draw the, draw the webinar to an end. Um, thank you, Sally, for, for joining and participating. Um, and many thanks, Arvid. Fascinating webinar. We'll be posting this on the website over the course of the coming weeks, along with the other series of webinars that, that, that we're completing at the moment throughout throughout June. Um, I hope that everybody's found this, this informative and interesting and any follow-up questions you might have, don't hesitate to contact us at, at, at DTA Wales and we will field your, your, your call accordingly. So with that being said, I'd just like to thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks for hosting. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now.